You're listening to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. Big John McCarthy has witnessed the best that the UFC had to offer. That is it! Game, set, back! We have a new champion! Your backstage pass to the world of mixed martial arts and combat sports. Only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Let's get it on! Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and me, Sean Wheelock. Every week on this podcast, John and I give you an inside look at MMA and combat sports, always separating fact from fiction. On this week's program, we'll look back at last Saturday's UFC event in New Jersey, discussing the outstanding win by 21-year-old Paige Van Zant and how she's now poised to become the next breakout star in MMA. John and I will also review the only real controversy from that card, Jago Brando's win over Jim Hedis as the direct result of the bloody and mangled left ear of Hedis. Plus, we'll examine Anderson Silva's quest to represent Brazil in Taekwondo at the 2016 Summer Olympics and the chances of mixed martial arts ever being included in the Olympic Games. And as we do on every episode of Let's Get It On, John will answer your questions, so ask away via email, info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. That's info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. Remember that you can download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. This past Saturday, UFC on Fox 15 took place in Newark, New Jersey, with Luke Rockhold, Jacques Array, and Max Holloway all scoring impressive victories. But John, 21-year-old Paige Van Zant seems to have captured the vast majority of media and fan attention with her dominant unanimous decision win over Felice Herrig. She was impressive, wasn't she? I mean, you know, everyone going into that fight is looking at, and talking about the fact that, oh, it's two girls that are pretty girls that are, you know, you know, getting a lot of attention because of their looks and things like that. And you, you really have to go past that and look at what, you know, Paige has done and what she, you know, she did leading up to the fight with uh, Felice. She's gone in there and she has, the one thing I'll, I'll say about it, she goes in and she fights. Man, she, you know, she doesn't sit there and lay back. She goes after people and she, she goes after, you know, the transitions. And when she gets in a bad position, she doesn't only look to defend, she looks to attack and she does everything that we're looking for a fighter to do in bringing the, you know, the fight to an end. Although she doesn't have power, you know, it's the one thing I'm going to say about her. But most girls at 115 don't have power. So, you know, she, she dominated position. She dominated the fight. She dominated a very skilled and veteran fighter in Felice Herrig in, in a fight that a lot of people didn't think that she would uh, do well in. She just shined, and you got to give her credit. She's only got one loss on her record. That's to Tisha Torres. I was there for that fight, and that was, you know, one of those fights they stood toe to toe and banged. And I, you know, and I was impressed with her at the time. I was like, how in the world is this girl just standing there taking some of those shots and throwing back the way she was? It, it was impressive, and it's impressive what she's done in the UFC to this point. John, Dana White was quoted post-fight by MMA Junkie as saying, everybody in my dressing room tonight wanted to meet her, so we brought her back, and she's got that thing. I believe what Dana White is saying, that thing that Paige Van Zandt possesses is the intangible quality. So look, looks play a factor, there's no doubt, but you can be the best-looking fighter, male or female in the world, but if you don't win, that really doesn't matter for a great deal, but it's that intangible quality. And that's a pretty bold statement by Dana White. Again, considering the star power there, if nothing else with Luke Rockhold and Jacques Array. Oh my God. You know, look at Luke Rockhold put on a performance against an incredible fighter in Leota Machida. And you know, look at if Paige Van Zandt, I'm going to say if Paige Van Zandt is the Barbie, then, then Luke Rockhold is the Ken. So I'm sure there's a lot of <laughs> girls that would like to meet Luke Rockhold, but when you're looking at Paige, people are impressed with pretty girls that act like men at certain points of their lives where they're, they're fighting and fighting with skill and fighting in a way that most guys wish they could fight. Because, you know, I, most guys think, oh, in a fight, I'll do this, I'll do that. You know, and they're about 4,000% wrong. <laughs> they can't do anything <laughs> they think they would do. And this girl's out there doing it. But, you know, you got to give her credit. Paige is going about doing this the right way. She's training with really good people. She's out, you know, she's not a male, but she's out of Team Alpha Male, you know, from up in Sacramento. She's been, uh, you know, training with really 
high level guys and that's what you have to do if you're a girl you can't just sit there and train only with girls you've got to train with guys you got to get your butt kicked now i don't mean get get your butt kicked where you're getting hurt but you got to be put in bad positions and figure out that you know what when i'm in this bad position this is what i have to do this is what i have to do i'm going to be okay i need to move this way i need to move that i need to take this away those are the things that she's getting from where she's training and it's showing in her fights John, I think the expression is the taller the tree, the sharper the axe. And already we're seeing the page vans and backlash. People are saying she's had a half dozen pro MMA fights. She's five and one, just two in the UFC. It's 21 years old. It seems like the media, a lot of the fans, Dana White, are anointing her as the next big thing. And initially, it seemed like after the win, at least online, social media, as well as traditional MMA media, Great win over Fleece Herrig, which it was. But now you're starting to see the negativity, which I really don't think is fair at all. <laughs> you know what? You can say negativity. You can say jealousy. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's a matter of there's always going to be the girls. You know, if you're, if you're the Tisha Torres who has beaten Paige and, and beat her pretty convincingly, you can sit there and say, hey, what about me? If you're <sighs> Joanna Jedzerjic, who is the champion at the 115-pound class, you're going to have to look and say, you know, here's a girl that can really fight. What about me? And this is a, this is a problem with being a promoter. You know, you have people that are out there that are great fighters that sometimes are not easy to promote. You have some people that aren't great fighters that are incredibly easy to promote. And that's just part of, you know, being a promoter and figuring out what is it with that person that's going to catch the public's attention? What is it that you can start to hang your hat on and put out there as far as, you know, you want to see this fighter? And, you know, look at when you're looking at Paige Van Zandt, when people are, they're seeing a pretty girl that can fight. And so if you're the promoter, are you going to sit there and ignore it? You can't ignore it. Why are you going to ignore something that's going to, you know, bring people's eyes to your promotion? You're going to... You're going to go and, and promote the things about her that are sellable. And one of the things about her that's sellable is her personality and her looks. And so push it. It doesn't matter. You know, this is about pushing Paige to the you know, utmost of what you can do to get people to put, her eye, put eyes on her and her fights. If she wins, great. If she loses, no problem. You know, bring her back again. But the real problem you'll end up seeing is the other girls in that weight category that are above Paige are the ones that are going to really get upset because they see the UFC with that huge promotional machine they have starting to back this girl, which I don't blame them. They should, but they've got to balance that whole thing with all the other girls. Doesn't this feel a lot like what Roger Huerta went through with the UFC? Absolutely. It's exactly what he went through. You know, it's people are looking at it. You know, when Roger, you know, Roger is the only athlete in mixed martial arts competition that can say, I was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. He got the cover. Now, I can tell you, at the time, they were they were set to put Randy Couture on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And we had the fight down in Houston, Texas. It was UFC 20, uh, 69. He ends up fighting Leonard Garcia. And in that fight, he does a couple of things. And they take a picture of him throwing a front kick into Leonard and they loved it and they pushed Randy off to the side and they put Roger Huerta on the cover. And if you don't think that there was some bad feelings and hurt egos over who was put on that cover, you're crazy. You know, that's all people, you know, wanting to be that guy and wanting to have that, you know, press and that, you know, promotion behind them. And Roger Huerta got it. And you know what? That's okay. It's there's times as the promoter, you need to try to push people. There's times that you know what you sometimes don't even have control of what goes out. You you're just happy that it's one of your fighters. I know Roger Huerta from when he fought in Bellator. I really like Roger a lot. I got to know him as a person. I really liked him then. And I, I tell you, I like him now, but he's look, a fantastic on, guy, fantastic guy. But all the hype on Roger Huerta, he left the UFC. He was Bjorn Rebney's first big, quote unquote, free agent signing for Bellator, <laughs> came in season two, April of 2010. He won his first fight. He defeated Chad Hinton. Then he last, lost to Pat Curran. Then he lost to Eddie Alvarez. He was gone from Bellator. He had already exited the UFC. So that whole hype train around Roger Huerta, people saying, oh, he was getting it because he's a good looking guy or he has a great backstory or great style. 
You don't hear a lot about Roger Huerta anymore. My point is, John, I think you agree. Ultimately, it's about results. They can push Paige Van Zant all they want, but if she got knocked out or submitted by Felice Herrig in 30 seconds, the hype train slows down. If she loses four fights in a row, the hype train probably completely derails. Absolutely. You know, look at you can sit there and you know, I can sit here and joke and say, you know, I hate Roger Huerta. The guy's too goddamn good looking for me. <laughs> Just, you know, I can say the same thing about you know Luke Rockle. You know, I, whenever girls sit there and don't know the sport of MMA and say, you know, oh those guys that got funky ears, oh and it's like that, I'll pull up a picture of Luke Rockle and say, here, this is a top fighter, and they go, he's a fighter, you know, and it's like. I, I hate to say it, you know, but I don't pull up an ugly guy. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm going to pull up a good looking <laughs> guy and say, you know, this, this is a fighter. But it, I wouldn't be pulling up Luke Rockhold if he wasn't a good fighter. And Luke Rockhold would not get the promotion he's getting behind him if he was not an exceptional fighter. Yeah, he's a good looking guy. Yeah, Paige Van Zandt is a pretty girl. But they have to prove themselves in that cage. And that's the marker of how far a promoter can push. Ronda Rousey has had how much publicity. You know, she's gotten a ton. She deserves every bit of it. And what backs it all up is what she's done in that cage. She has been exemplary. I can't even say the word. Exemplary in her performances. And what she's done in the cage makes it easy for a promoter to back everything they want behind her and say, look at our champion, look at the way this girl fights, and on top of it, she's good looking. You know what? That's not Rhonda's fault. That's not Paige's fault. That's life. And if a promoter can push it, let them push it. John, irony of ironies. So Fleece Herrig is the opponent, and I got to know Fleece really well when she fought for us in Bellator. I think she's one of the more misunderstood people in MMA. I found her to be sweet, personable, forthcoming, polite, outstanding qualities as a human being. And yet there's always been the knock on Fleece Herrig. Maybe it's only stopped now because it shifted over to Paige Van Zandt with the fight on Saturday in the UFC, <laughs> that Felice Herrig was only where she was because she's selling a certain image of being really good looking and she would pose for photos like wearing the fake glasses or the schoolgirl uniform, different outfits, things like that. But I always thought that, that, that negative attention on Felice Herrig was unfair because ultimately Felice was proving herself, winning fights. It is unfair, and it's uh, but this is where – you know, egos get get involved and the pride of saying, I think I'm a better fighter than you. And you're doing this in this fashion. You're pu publicizing yourself because you think or the public thinks that you're pretty. And so you're not doing this as a fighter would do it. You're doing this as a pretty girl. And that's ridiculous. Whatever Felice Herrig, and I'm going to tell you, I think Felice Herrig is gold. I've told other fighters, you need to look at Felice Herrig, look at what she's doing as far as marketing, as far as selling herself, as far as what she does for her sponsors. Because if you're a sponsor and you're looking to sponsor an athlete, you want an athlete that's going to get involved with your product. You don't want someone that's just going to sit there and say, oh, here, give me money and I'll put a patch on my you know, shirt or my pants and, and I'll wear it out you know, so the public can see it. That doesn't do you any good. You need a fighter to get involved. And the one thing that Felice Herrig proved is, yes, she took cool pictures as far as schoolgirl or Superman and she always – you know, I can't, was it Rosie the Riveter? She came out right. at one time, you know, you got to love that. There's some thought process in there and she's doing things to grab people's attention and it works and God bless her for doing it. And don't get mad at her. Learn from her. This is the same as I try to tell everybody is, you know what? There's no such thing as losing. When you, when you get in a fight, if you lose, it's not a loss, it's a lesson and learn from it. Learn what you did wrong. Learn what you could have done better, and let's work on those things. And if you're not getting the attention that Paige Van Zandt is getting or Felice Herrig is getting, learn from it. Learn what to do to promote yourself. Don't expect other people to do your work. Learn what you need to do and learn how to be a part of some type of apparel or some type of product that looks at you and says, this person 
actually helps push my product, I will always back them. I will always be the sponsor of this person because they help me sell my product. And to your point, uh, Paige Van Zant has a personal sponsorship deal with Reebok, which is separate from the overall UFC Reebok deal. Look, nobody forced the Reebok executives to sign Paige Van Zant, and there are a lot of really attractive female fighters across women's MMA, certainly in the UFC. But there was that intangible quality, the idea of she quote unquote gets it, she's going to go above and beyond, that elected Reebok to sign presumably what's going to be a big money promotional and sponsorship contract with Paige Van Zant. Well, yeah, I mean, and you look at, well, what, what, with what the UFC just decided to do with the Reebok contract, which I like. You know, it, it takes away a lot of the uh, speculation as far as rankings and stuff, and it puts it on seniority. Well, Paige Van Zant's not very senior in the UFC. She hasn't had but, you know, a couple of fights there. And so she's had, what, three fights in the UFC? I don't know, I'm trying to think. but Two, yeah, 5-1 and one and 2-0 and oh in the UFC. Okay. And so you look and you go, well, she's going to be low end on the Reebok ladder of getting money. Okay, I kind of look at, that's fair. But if Reebok looks at that person and believes that that person can help sell their product, Reebok has all the right in the world to say, we're going to sign you to a contract. And she, as the person, has all the right in the world to say, absolutely, I would love to back your product. I would love to help sell it and let me do everything I can for you. And if you're the person out there that wishes they had that contract, then start doing things to get yourself in a position to be looked at and considered for that same contract. John, I think the big picture of this is that the UFC, with their women fighters, they need a second star. Ronda Rousey, I would argue right now Ronda Rousey is the biggest mainstream general public fighter in our sport. What I mean is that people who don't really follow MMA – would probably know who Ronda Rousey is, maybe from <laughs> films, from her talk shows. I don't think it's close. Yeah, I, I, I don't I think good. it's so, close. So we're right there. It, it's not even close. It's like when I worked in soccer, everybody knew who David Beckham was. They didn't know what a Real Madrid was or what a Manchester United was, but they certainly knew David Beckham. And I get that with Rousey, but you don't want to build that proverbial house of cards. What if Rousey loses? What if she decides, you know what, I've done everything I want. Now I want to go have a film career, just like Gina Carano. So they need that other big star. They need more than just another big star. But to me, Paige Van Zandt, just 21 years old, but she's being positioned now is that second big women's MMA star, at least the second big female fight. The one thing I'm going to say, I think you're wrong in what you're saying. When, when you say that Ronda Rousey you know, could possibly be that house of cards if she loses. No, no I don't think Ronda is. I, I think it, it is for the UFC. Well, I mean, you look at it, if Ronda loses, in a, in a way, it almost helps the UFC because they're, they're in a position, they can't find anybody to compete with this girl, you know, in a way that people actually believe that the other girl has a chance. Most people are looking at Ronda as, oh, you know, there's no one that can beat her. Now, is that true? No, there's always someone out there that can give another fighter problems. But the way that the fans look at it, you know, she's in that position that you know no one can touch her the the real problem is when you're backing somebody you know as elite xc did with kimbo slice and 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 this is not putting you know kimbo down in any way but when he was fighting for elite xc he was a limited mma fighter because his ground was weak he was a stand up guy that was tough who would throw but if put on his back, he couldn't get himself out of the positions. He didn't have the skill level at the time that Elite XC was trying to push him. That was your house of cards. That's your problem because you have someone who the whole house can come down with one little you know, blow of, of wind, and that's your problem. And that's the question with Paige Van Zant that people are looking at saying she's not that good. No, you know what? She is good. She's beaten some good fighters. And when she beat Felice Herrig the way she did – she proves she's a good fighter. You can see, you know, people can not like Felice if they if they want. But I'm going to tell you right now, Felice Herrig is a good fighter and a good fighter in multiple levels of our sport. She's got a good ground game. Her ground game with, you know, Jeff Curran is outstanding. She pulls off some great submissions and stuff. Obviously, there's always things that she can get, you know, done or do that will be better. But her stand-up is tight. Her ground game is good. Her wrestling is good. This is a good fighter, and she got dominated by Paige Van Zandt. So you got to look at Paige and say, hey, you know what? She's proving herself. 
John, last point on that. I'll go back to the House of Cards. I think you've pretty much won me over, but and I don't think this is a realistic scenario, but just let me pose this anyway. Let's say Ronda Rousey loses her next three fights. Does the UFC's women's, I don't want to say division because they're running multiple divisions, does the UFC's focus on women's fighting, does that collapse along with it if Rousey goes 0-3? No, I, I absolutely not. I think what, what would you enough- have said a year? What would you have said a year ago? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. You know, I agree. Yes. You know, it, it, a year ago, everything was riding on Ronda doing well. Now you have people that have, you know, it, the hardcore people that understood women's MMA. And look at, there's a lot of male fighters out there that didn't understand women's MMA and, and looked at it like, oh no, women should not be fighting. No, I don't like it. I don't like seeing a girl you know, get punched. I don't like, th- that's okay. That's a personal preference and a personal choice. But what the girls have proven time and time again is they have skill. They can fight. They may not do things exactly the same as men do. They may not have power like men do at times. But technically, you watch what they do in the cage. Man, they do some phenomenal things. And it's almost they have this grit of, you know, I have to prove myself. And so I'm going to go out there and and just throw caution to the wind and go after this which sometimes, you know, leads to fight of the night with the women when it's an all-men's card except for one woman's fight, and the woman's fight ends up being fight of the night. I think the women have proven that, you know what, they're there to compete. They can absolutely fight with skill, and people now appreciate what they do. I love women's MMA. You know, my older daughter, Ellie, is nine. She's been training in Muay Thai for 18 months now. You're going to be refereeing the upcoming Invicta. I'm going. It's in my hometown of Kansas City. I've always been a proponent of women's MMA, and I'm glad that it's flourishing. I'm glad we're seeing the depths, not just in the UFC, in Bellator, around the sport, even on the local level. It's a really great time, I think, for the sport being so progressive. Boxing never embraced women's fighting, even with Christy Martin as their poster child in the 1990s. Then with Layla Ali, they never, I don't think, the boxing culture and community embraced the the women the way that MMA is doing right now. Yeah, you know, I, I think there are reasons for that. I think, you know, when you look at uh, what women do in MMA mimics what the men do at a higher level because of the fact that submission-wise, a woman can submit another woman. A woman can hit a woman with a a kick or a knee that can knock the woman out. Punching-wise, women are not going to have the power that a man has. It's just not going to happen. There are, of, of course, there are some women that are up there, but it's few and far between. And so when, what happened with women's boxing is we ended up, although we had some knockouts, we ended up going to a lot of decisions. A lot. <laughs> a lot. And that's what ended up hurting women's boxing was the fan basically got to the point where they'd see a woman's match and go, oh, it's going to go the it's six rounds. It's going to go the eight rounds. It's going to go the 10 rounds. It's going to go whatever you know it was set up for. They just put it off that this fight was going to go the distance where they don't they can't do that with MMA. There is always, you know, especially take a look at Ronda what she does. You know, that fight can end at any moment and that's what has kept women's MMA strong. So we've talked a lot about Paige Van Zanter performance on that really entertaining UFC card this And you're past only Saturday. doing it cuz she's pretty. <laughs> that, that's it. Yeah, it's my only motivation. That's right. Maybe Reebok will give me a sponsorship. You never know, John. <laughs> well, also on that card, I think one of the better UFC cards, one, certainly one of the better UFC Fox cards that took place in Newark, New Jersey. Jago Brando defeated Jim Hedis by first round TKO. A lot of you didn't see this fight. It wasn't part of the Fox broadcast. It was the second fight of the night. It was on Fight Pass. You can see it online, though, for free. Uh, he said quietly. Dan Morgliato, a good friend of ours, was the referee. Now, he stopped the fight after round one on the advice of the cage side physician because the left ear of Hedis popped, split, and then was gushing blood. Really, again, the only controversy, and John, it brings up an interesting point because in the unified rules of MMA, the referee is the quote unquote sole arbiter. But Mergliata does what a referee is going to do, what, 999 times out of a thousand, if not more. Cage side <laughs> physician, ringside physician says, stop the fight. You stop the fight as the referee, even though by the letter of the rules, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. But if you, uh, if you want to avoid the shitstorm that's going to come your way, <laughs> you might want to think about it. Look at here. But then Dan it came anyway a, to Big Dan, didn't it? You know what? Dan is a, a grown man and understands that people 
are nuts and they get mad at him for doing what is his job. And, and this is what needs to be, ah, oh my God, this is so frustrating for me because people look at fights like they're life and death. They're not. It's a sport. And when you look at Jim Hedis in his ear, this is what people don't look at. We've had, we've had fighters lose part of or almost their entire ear during a fight. All of a sudden, they get hit with something, and the top of their ear comes out. Sakuraba had his ear basically fall off in the ring. All right? These things happen, and when they do, the fight's over. And people look at Hedis, and they sit there, and they go, oh, it was cut. It shouldn't have been stopped. No, look at If he loses this fight, what is it that is going to end up causing his life because of this fight a terrible you know you know reaction that's going to be you know off of it his life is going to be horrible no it's a fight the you know the best part about this is the ufc they look at it yes it's a loss on his record but they know hey he got he got hit with an elbow it cut his ear the doctor stopped it they don't look at him in a way saying oh he can't fight they know he can fight what do we want do we want his ear to get hit again and you know, if you look at that thing, this is like Leslie Smith with her ear. She did not want the fight to stop. Okay. She didn't. When we were in Mexico, she didn't want the fight to stop and they stopped the fight. And Hedis didn't want the fight to stop because he's a competitor, because she's a competitor and she wants to win. And I totally understand that. But if you take the fighter out of that moment and you sit there and say, all right, Here's a choice I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the choice of I'm going to put you in a fight. Your ear is going to get damaged. And I mean damaged bad to the point where it falls off. It gets hit with a blow that actually tears it off of your head and we can't put it back. So for the rest of your life, you're not going to have an ear on the outside of your head there. And the the buffer between it is I'm going to say that You're in a fight with it. I'm not going to tell you whether you're going to win or lose, uh, but you get the choice of being able to stay in the fight. What do you think they're going to say if they're not in that competitive moment? They're going to say, no, I don't want my ear to be off of my head. Okay, and that's what the doctor's looking at. He looks at it. He sees that it's cut. He sees the damage. He sees that the cartilage that makes up that cauliflower has been severed across, and the only thing holding his ear on is a tiny flap of skin to the very edge and to the back part. And it can happen where he gets hit again, and the whole ear comes off. And so now we have an ear that we allowed the guy to get what is basically mayhem in law. We're tearing a bodily part off of him because of a sport. You know what? There comes a point that, you know, we've said this for years. This is like chess. You got checkmated. Okay, you, you, you got hit with a shot. It, it, it severed your ear or exploded your ear in such a fashion that your ear could actually come off of your head. That's the end of the fight. It's okay. It's just a fight. John, I think the fighters, and you just hit on this heat of the moment, they don't help their cases any, and it goes to the larger issue of sometimes a fighter needs to be protected from themselves. That's why corners are given a towel to throw in in combat sports. So a couple of quotes for you. Again, these are both post-fight heat of the moment. So Jim Hedis said, If you can see, my cauliflower made it pretty ugly to begin with, so I don't mind if my ear fell off. Leslie Smith, you talk about the fight in the UFC back in Mexico City in November. Very similar situation. More brutal, more graphic, though, in her loss to Jessica I. Herb Dean was the referee, second round. Leslie Smith was quoted as saying, I would trade my ear for a win in a heartbeat. Actually, Leslie, no, I don't think that you would, really. You certainly wouldn't when you're 65. You you look at it, man. (laughs) It's easy for the fighter at the moment to sit there and say, I'll lose my ear for the win. Because they're not looking at the future. And this is what athletes do. And this is where they did a study. I'm going to just bring this out because they did a study with Olympic athletes that said, if we could give you a pill that guaranteed you were going to win the Olympic gold medal, but it also guaranteed that within five years, you would be dead. 
would you take the pill? And over half of them said yes. Okay, now that's because they, they're living in the moment. As you get older, you realize, you know, life is important and there's certain elements to it that make it to where you want to live your life at the highest quality you can and you don't want to walk around without an ear because people start staring at you and it just becomes, you know, a hindrance and a problem for you that's like, yeah, yeah. And they'll say, what happened to you? I lost in the fight. Whoop. You know, and then <laughs> when it becomes... I lost it in a professional fight, an actual sporting event, because MMA is a sport. This is not a street fight. This is a sport. We don't allow people to lose actual appendages on their body in a sport because, oh, the fans want to see the fight go on. That's just ridiculous. There comes a point where the doctor comes in, and as the referee, when the doctor says, Hey, I can't let that thing, I can't, you've got to stop it. That thing's too bad. His ear can actually come off. As the referee, I don't think, two, two, two seconds about it. I, thank you very much. I waved the fight off and we let the guy come back on another day and compete to the best of his level after his ear has healed up. It's an ear. I'm not saying it's going to kill him, but it's an ear that, you know what? It would be nice for him to live the rest of his life with it. I think a lot of the reaction, too, from the fans, even from the media in some circles, is because of the reaction of the fighters. And again, we talk about it's almost the role that you have to protect yourselves. And the fighters, I think, sometimes they'll recognize, look, if I have a cut eyelid and we're talking about optic nerve damage or a torn retina, that's one thing. But I, I think a fighter's argument, which is totally ridiculous to me, but at least here to the moment is, look, it's cosmetic. If I want my ear to be off, that's fine. If I want to have a huge gaping wound that requires 90 stitches, that's fine. But it's not really up to them at that point. No, it's not. And, and you know what? There's reasons why it's not. And part of the reason it's not because they're not going to make a good decision in the heat of the moment. And that's just, you know, that's okay. But we've got to understand and fans have to understand. They put so much emphasis on winning and losing in our sport. And that's fine. But if the worst thing, I tell fighters all the time, if the worst thing that happens in your life is you lose a fight, you've got a phenomenal life. It's not that big of a deal. You know what? We don't lose, we learn. And when we learn from what, you know, what happened, hey, what I hope a lot of people are learning is, don't let your goddamn ears get to be cauliflower, okay? <laughs> a lot of people like it. You know, we get, I got kids at the gym now wanting to sit there and they're hitting themselves in the ear. It's like, what are you doing? I, I want, it's cool. It's not cool, okay? It is a problem possibly if you, this is something you want to do, you know, it's nice to have those nice flappy soft ears that don't cut and don't break because they have all of that accumulated, you know, blood that has, you know, calcified inside of that ear. Man, it, it can cause you a problem. And that's why we try, you know, I, I drain ears all the time and I do it because I know that that cauliflower can become a problem. Have you ever been put in a situation in MMA where the cage side or ringside physician wanted to stop the fight and because you're the sole arbiter and have this right, you said, no, nope, not going to stop it? Or 100% of the time, have you gone to the guy who has the medical degree? <laughs> well, uh, all right. The truth is I have had – there's all levels of ringside physicians. I actually had a veterinarian in Topeka, Kansas. I was refereeing yeah, boxing. This was in the late 90s, and it was a veterinarian. I'm sure he was an outstanding veterinarian, but <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Yeah, and it's what, what people don't realize is ringside physicians, you know, this is a doctor. This is someone that has a medical degree, and I can tell you I have worked with ringside physicians that are, you know, highly skilled plastic surgeons, emergency room doctors, neurosurgeons, I can tell you that I have worked with some that are gynecologist. I have worked with ones that are urologist. I have worked with ones that are psychiatrist. Okay. So they're all different and there are unbelievable, you know, ringside physicians out there. And, you know, you look at Sherry Walken from New Jersey, who was, you know, at the fight. She's a phenomenal ringside physician. She doesn't get squeamish about things. She doesn't sit there and just stop a fight because it needs to be stopped. You had, you know, you have, you got people like David Watkins in in Nevada. You have Paul Wallace in California, or you know Jeff Roberts or Eddie Ayub. You get, you know, 
all these people that are out there that are phenomenal ringside physicians that actually go away from what their Hippocratic oath is in always taking care of and understanding I need to take care of this person, but this is a sporting event and I need to let things go as far as I can let it go. They're out there. But then you also work with some that, you know what, they're not that good at the job because they're just not able to separate that Hippocratic oath from, you know, the sport. And they're always wanting to take care of the athlete when at times they should let it go. So my job as a referee is to work with the ringside physician. And at times, do I try to influence them? Yes, I do. You know, I'm going to tell them, hey, look, you know, this is going on. You know, the, the doctor is looking at it and thinking about, you know, this might be too bad. I think we want to stop the fight and I'll give them something to let them know, hey, I'm looking at it too. Let's let this go. And if it gets worse, I'll bring the fighter to you and I'll just try to work with them. And I've done that in the past. I've had times, you know, when I've had a fighter, and the, the, the ringside physician is just not that, you know, uh, he's not that much of a veteran at what he's doing. And, you know, I've talked him into letting the fight go. And inside my mind, I'm going, I'm never bringing this fight back to you because you don't know what you're doing with this fighter and what you're looking at. This is not a bad cut. You know, and I'm, I shouldn't, you know, look at it like I know what I'm looking at, but I know what I'm looking at. I've been taught by enough doctors what's bad, what's not, and why it's bad. And we have to work with them. And there's, like I said, there's times when I'm going to try to push them in a certain way and I'm going to lead them down a road because it's what's right for the fighter. It's what's right for the sport. It's what's right for the fans. And I need to separate a doctor from that Hippocratic oath that they've taken and make them understand this is a sport. You, this person has been put in harm's way on their own, you know, pretext. They want to be here. They, this is their job. And we need to let them go, although they're damaged a little bit, we need to let them go farther before we stop this fight on them. And so you, you work both ways. Still to come on this week's episode of Let's Get It On, John and I will discuss Anderson Silva's quest to represent Brazil in Taekwondo at the 2016 Summer Olympics and the likelihood that mixed martial arts will ever be included in the Olympic Games. Plus, as we do every week, we will answer your outstanding questions with Big John McCarthy. I'm Sean Wheelock, and you are listening to Let's Get It On. It's the book that Wrestling Observer calls a must-read for any MMA fan. Jonathan Snowden of Bleacher Report describes as riveting and amazing, and thefightner.com says nothing is held back. Pick this book up right away. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It, written by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the foreword by John McCarthy, is now available to listeners of this podcast at the special price of $12.48. That's far less than you'll pay for the book on Amazon and half price of what you'll pay in store at Barnes & Noble. Buy it directly from the publisher now online at ascendbooks.com and enter the promo code LEGAL50. That's A-S-C-E-N-D books.com, promo code LEGAL50. Learn the true story of how the UFC came into existence in the book that Randy Couture describes as honest, shocking, and enthralling, and that has a rating of 4.9 out of 5 stars from Amazon Reader Reviews. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the forward by Big John McCarthy. Available now online at ascendbooks.com for just $12.48 when you use the promo code LEGAL50. For all of our listeners looking for great new designs in MMA apparel, Look to the new clothing styles of Lambs to Lions. That's right, Lambs to Lions has got new styles with old and new put together. Boxing, MMA, everything. Go to lambstolionsbrand.com and check out their line of clothing. Hey, this is Sean Wheelock. And this is Big John McCarthy. If you're a fan of our show, then you're going to love the rest of the Ignotainment podcast lineup. Like the Ocho Man behind the eight ball and the Whiskey Philosopher with Jeff Cooper. You can find these great podcasts and more at Ignotainment.com. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the program. Let's get it all! Now, back to Let's Get It On 
with your hosts, Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. John and I really enjoy getting your questions and answering them every week on this podcast. Ask away via email, info at let's get it on podcast.com. Again, info at let's get it on podcast.com. And of course, please include instructions on how to correctly pronounce your name. I'm always going to say that every week, and you guys are getting it. I appreciate it. Well, an easy name to pronounce. He's also a good friend of ours from Ontario, Todd Anderson, outstanding MMA referee, John, and he has an outstanding question. John, can you suggest a 10 fight list? five boxing, and five MMA that would capture the true nature of each sport and would allow fans of one sport to appreciate the other more. Ah, wow. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for that simple question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, you know what? The, I don't Todd. think you can break things down in the top five. That's just horror. That's horrible. All right. I don't know. What do you think, Sean? <laughs> Uh, so some of the pop – well, in boxing, you would have to almost think of the trilogy, wouldn't you, with, with Ali and Frazier. My all-time favorite fight, more, more for the backstory, is actually Ali and George Foreman. MMA, I love oh, uh, see, pride. You know what? Pe- people go and they, they put Ali and Foreman up as one of the greatest fights, and that's – go back and watch it. But it's you the backstory that I like. Yeah, it's not the a great, great backstory, yeah. but the fight itself, Bally yeah. is getting – he looks like a heavy bag for freaking eight rounds basically. Yeah, for And then, sure. he, then he, th- he throws some punches and, and Foreman goes down. All right. Well, you know what? All right. <laughs> here, we, here we go. Absolutely, you got to go with Ali Frazier. And I'll go with Ali Frazier 1. And this is in no specific order of top you know, one, two, three. Ali Frazier won March 8th of 1971. I use that fight all the time because of the hype behind it, but they lived up to the hype with an incredible fight. And the trilogy of the three, you know, especially with the Thriller in Manila, you got to watch the Ali Frazier fights. Marvin Hagler fights Thomas Hearns. Absolutely. Three rounds, one of the most unbelievable exhibitions of just brutality when it comes to two guys standing, throwing, going after it, an incredible three-round fight. Um, Mickey Ward against Arturo. Anyone <laughs> against anyone. You talk about the Mickey trilogy. Ward. The trilogy is there again, and I like trilogies because you know what they they show that obviously there was something really great with the fighting between those two styles. But you know, you look at the first fight of Gotti versus Ward. Just an incredible fight. You know, the ninth round of that fight. My God, it was just unbelievable. There was a fighter that I loved growing up. Alexis Arguello fought yeah. Aaron Pryor and fought him three times. And, you know, I loved Arguello and he couldn't beat Pryor. But when he fought him in November of, uh, I think it was 82, I mean, one of the most gutsy performances by both guys. Just incredible. Um I mean, you, you got to go, you know, Leonard versus Duran, number one in Montreal, 1980. Just, you know, an incredible fight. You look at the backstory of that and what Duran did to set Leonard up. He, he questioned his manhood. He made Leonard fight a fight that was tailor-made for Duran. He, he talked him into being a man and setting his feet down and throwing. And that's what Leonard did, and it made him lose. But it was an incredible fight. One of the best fights I've ever seen in person. Uh, Tim Bradley versus Ruslan Provodnikov. It was fight of the year last year. Just an incredible boxing match. Um, God damn, there's so many. There was Ron Lyle fought George Foreman as a heavyweight, and there was I think it was the fourth round of that fight. There was I think seven knockdowns total in that fight, but I think they knocked each other down like you know five times, two two to one guy, you know three to the next, and it was the end of the fight. But just if you look at heavyweights, you love power. That was just an unbelievable fight. There's so many. What? Do, let me throw a few more. So go ahead. Let's hear. Really them. going back now. Maybe this is more cultural significance. But oh, what Joe, about Lewis, Diego Joe Lewis, Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling too. What about Diego Corrales, Jose Luis Castillo. Absolutely. There you go. Amazing. Great fight there. What about Tyson Douglas? Fight. I'm sorry. Which one? What, Tyson Douglas. Ow! Oh, come on. You can. <laughs> What what about Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns one? Yep. Angelo you're Dundee, you're blowing it, son. You're blowing it yep. to Ray Leonard. It was a great fight, man. I remember sitting in my dad's apartment watching that one, man. That was awesome. What about, right, you know, you go go back and let's watch my favorite fighter of all time is Sugar Ray Robinson. 
Yeah. You want to see a fighter. You want to see a guy that, you know, is still to this day. If you want to take a guy from the past and say he could fight today, you know, Sugar Ray Robinson had some unbelievable wars, you know. A hundred, God, I don't even know what his record is, but I know he was like 173 and one at a certain time in his career. Just unbelievable. When I was a kid, I read a boxing magazine and they had like the top 50 or top 100 fighters of all time. And then next to the fighter on their ranking, like what could they have done to be a better fighter? They had Ray <laughs> Robinson number one. And in that category, it said walk on water, which I found. <laughs> that's, about, that's about right. All right, let's what go about, to MMA. Let oh, me open up with this in MMA. I do have more so boxing. boxing right now. Go ahead. Let's go. Okay, the, the fight that I love from Pride in 2000, Mark Coleman versus Igor Vovchanchin. Oh, my God. That? that was a good, was a good fight, but definitely not on my top five. Um, that was the significance of that fight being the tournament. But see, they both had to fight that night before. Right. So it takes something away from their ability to bring it all into that, um, you know, everything they have at the best of their you know abilities in that fight wasn't possible and so that's it takes it away from me give me another one let me hear uh ufc4 and i think this is a turning point for four. wrestlers you or you referee this dan severn versus hoist gracie to me that's the shift even though severn got triangled by hoist gracie that's the shift when wrestlers saw an opening in mma Okay, I'm saying you're crazy. That fight was so <laughs> I mean, you have it was to like nice. grappling to like that fight, though. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. But if you look at it compared to the, today's fights, oh, I mean, I, I want like historical someone, significance. But go on, yeah, go on. It does. It absolutely has some historical significance. But I want you know, this is he saying we've got to pull fights that grab someone and say, man, yeah. that was fantastic. All right, I'm gonna go. Let's see. Again, no specific order. Um. Michael Chandler versus Eddie Alvarez, both fights, yep. but the second one they did, which I was lucky enough to referee, that was an incredible fight that has everything that we're talking about MMA in it. I mean, back and forth, all types of different techniques, incredible close submissions, incredible striking where they ended up hurting each other, just an incredible fight. Um, Gilbert Melendez Versus Diego Sanchez just because yeah. it was so freaking fun. <laughs> and it, that's part of Diego. And you know what? I could go in and, and look at and say, Diego Sanchez has some of the funnest fights to watch. If I was going to sit there and tell someone, all right, you want to watch MMA? I want you to watch some of Diego Sanchez. Now, he's been in some absolutely incredible fights. Him and Carl Parisian, man, there was some stuff that went on in that fight. If you go the first two rounds of that fight, Wow. Just incredible what was going on. Um, I got to go to UFC 139. Mauricio Shogun Hua against Dan Henderson. What a phenomenal fight. Phenomenal. Just back and forth. Both guys beating the piss out of each other. Huge damage done by Dan. But Mauricio hanging on. Dan running out of gas. That was incredible. John Jones versus Gustafsson. The significance of the level of that fight and what two guys at 220 pounds did for five rounds was incredible. And the way they competed against each other, I loved that fight. Um, just the way it went. Um, I mean, you, you could say that, you know, Fedor versus Krokop in Pride was a huge fight. And the way that I actually Fedor, thought about that, yeah. You know, the way that Fedor, you know, showed that he, he created the blueprint to beat Krokop. Everyone thought, you know, Krokop was going to, you know, possibly beat him because, you know, Krokop had that left kick. Fedor ends up making him go backwards and, and shows how to beat Krokop. Dennis Bermudez versus Matt Grice from the UFC in California. Oh, my God, what an incredible fight that was. Um, let's see, Anthony Pettis against Benson Henderson when he jumps off the cage in the WEC. My yeah. God, what a great first fight that one was. That was incredible. Nick Diaz, you watch his fights. And you watch um, like his one against Paul Daly. It was only one round, but you want to talk about one round of guys just standing there beating the hell out of each other. Or Nick Diaz against Takanori Gomi when he fought in Pride in, in Las Vegas. Here's a fight where you got Gomi who's winning the fight but is begging the referee to stop it because of a cut that Nick Diaz has is so big, but he's begging him to stop it because he knows I'm starting to lose and this guy's going to beat me. <laughs> it was an incredible fight. I mean, there's there's so many, but uh, I guess I've named five at least. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our Canadian friend Todd Anderson opened it up. You know what? Hit us up on email. Add to our list. 
How about really Couture great versus question, Liddell? All three. Yeah, all three. I mean, the trilogy. The trilogy. Yeah, let us know what you think. Info at let's get it on podcast.com. Boxing that MMA fans would appreciate and MMA that boxing fans would appreciate. All right, next question. Also a good one. Justin Hackett. He writes, guys, I just listened to last week's episode. Very enlightening. Based on this new perspective, Thank John, you. can you comment on or explain the GSP versus Johnny Hendricks decision? What did the judges see that we didn't? Oh, well, you know, when, when we're explaining that decision, we're going back into it, a time when – Judges are really afraid to give out that 10-8, and we're trying to work with judges and getting them to give more 10-8s. And I'm not saying that's the one. The key round uh, for Hendricks versus St. Pierre is the first round. That's the key round because if that round changes in, in a judge's mind, it changes the fight and who wins. And what we try to get judges to look at is fighters are always telling you what's effective and what's not. They don't do it verbally, but they do it by their actions. They do it by resetting. You see them coming in, they're coming forward. You watch Diego Sanchez against Gil Melendez, and this is where people don't get it. Diego is the aggressor. He's the guy going and, and you know being aggressive, and he's coming forward, and Gil throws one, two, three, boom, boom, and you see Diego take one step backwards, shakes his head, you know, hits his chest, but has to reset because it affected him. And then starts coming forward again, then gets hit again and resets. Well, if you go back to the St. Pierre Hendricks fight, the question is, how much credit do you give the submission attempt? Because that's what a judge is going to say that St. Pierre put on Hendricks. In the beginning, he goes for a submission. Is it close? I'm going to tell you as a judge, that's not even close, not even there. Okay, Hendricks does, he's got that thing beat from the beginning. It's not, he was never in any danger. So what we have is, we have a position. What does he do with the position? The position he doesn't do much with because the, I'm saying the submission's not even close. The difference for me and the most significant thing that happens in that round, Johnny Hendricks gets George St. Pierre putting him against the fence. George is trying to take him down and Johnny Hendricks hits him with elbows. Hits him with about four or five. And with that, he opens a cut, but you also see George get hit and his knee drops to the ground. Now, why does his knee drop to the ground? Is it because he's hurt? Is it because he's just trying to change? Well, how many times do you see a wrestler take and purposely drop his knees to the ground to then try for a takedown against someone who's up against a fence? Doesn't work for you. It's not something we do. It's not something that's logical in that I'm, do, I'm changing my position, putting my knee to the ground to benefit me in getting the result that I need in this takedown. So again, the fighter's talking to me. He's telling me that hurt. And that was the most significant element in that round that took place, in my opinion, was those elbows. There was some back and forth between both. But in the end, I'm going to give Johnny Hendricks that round based upon he hurt George, not you know significantly, but he hurt him, and he landed the most effective shots in that round with those elbows, and even cut him. So that's the real question. You know, everyone's going to look at things different, and everyone looks at things from a different angle. So what you can see on the TV sometimes is different than what the judge is seeing. You know, right there, it's a matter of you know we need to always get better at the judging. We need to always be looking at things, but fighters talk to you. They don't talk to you verbally, but they talk to you through their emotions, their actions, their body language. And, and as the judge, you got to be able to read it because it's going to tell you who's winning. Remember, email us your questions. Info, let's get it on podcast.com. Info, let's get it on podcast.com. Outstanding questions. We have a really smart listener base. Well, last week, MMAfighting.com first reported that Anderson Silva has formally declared his interest in representing Brazil in Taekwondo at the 2016 Summer Olympics. The former UFC middleweight champion sent a letter to the president of the Brazilian Taekwondo Federation in which he expressed his desire to be included in the squad. John, the reaction to this in and out of Brazil has not really been favorable for the spider Anderson Silva. Yeah, you know, you look at it and you go, you know, what do you expect? <laughs> you know, especially if you're a Taekwondo guy from Brazil and you have Anderson Silva, who I'm sure you have all the respect for in the world, saying, hey, I want one of those spots. 
you know what? Has Anderson put in the time to be a Taekwondo fighter? You know, it, look at fighting is not just fighting. It's not oh, I can you know because I can box, I can do MMA. Because I can do MMA, I can uh, I can do judo. Because I can you know do judo, I can do wrestling. No, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. You need to specialize, especially when you're getting to the Olympic level. I'm sure that Anderson would love to be part of the Olympic team from Brazil representing his country in Rio. It would be an incredible, you know, life experience. It would be something that, you know, would be, you know, something that he would remember for the rest of his life. The question is, does he deserve it? The question is, is he taking that spot from somebody who does deserve it? Someone that has put in the time, the work, the effort to get himself to that location. And now here comes a guy who absolutely was an incredible fighter in MMA saying, hey, you know what? I'd like one of those spots. Well, if I'm one of the guys from Brazil, I'm not too happy with Anderson Silva. John, here's an answer to your question. All right. So Silva, he is a black belt in Taekwondo. He competes at heavyweight in the sport. Heavyweight in Olympic and international judo was 176 pounds and above. Now, the top-ranked taekwondo heavyweight in Brazil. Yes, I did my research. It's Guilherme Cesario Felix. I did. He wrote on Facebook in Portuguese, and here's the English translation. Direct quote now. Let's stop kidding. Myself and most of the taekwondo athletes are fed up with this thing about Anderson Silva trying to apply for the Olympic Games. I have nothing against him. I don't even know him personally, but this is a laughing matter. You know, when it goes to the point that... Every time Anderson Silva is rolling or he's working on his Muay Thai or his wrestling or his cage control or bottom position, this guy and all of his teammates, everyone aspiring to be in the Olympics, are working on Taekwondo. Exactly. You know, and this is where ah, it frustrates me when people sit there and think, well, he's a black belt in Taekwondo. You know what? You know how many black belts there are in Taekwondo? Well, there's, there's a gym next to my grocery store. Every, every nine-year-old in there when I go buy shopping is a black belt. Exactly. Maybe they'll be in the Olympics too. You know, un- unfortunately, Taekwondo gives out way too many black belts. But you can even look at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And you know, I tell people all the time, you know, they say to me, you're a black belt. Yes, I'm a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. There's a difference between a black belt and world class. And when you're looking at you know, this competitor from Brazil who is world, he's the number one there. He's world class. And, you know, if I'm looking at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I'm saying, okay, guys in the heavyweight division, you know, that are world class, that are, you know, I'll even, you know, get into the point of, you know, that have been MMA fighters. You know, let's take a look at, you know, Fabricio Verdun. He's world class when it comes to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's not just a black belt, world class. That's a huge step up, you know. It's like you get people saying, you know, I'm a football player. I played in high school. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. You played in high school. You have no idea the level change between high school and college. And then you have no idea because the level change from college to pro is even greater. And to sit there and say, well, I played in in high school because that's what the black belt is, is ridiculous to think that you can play with the pros. I'm not saying that Anderson doesn't have a chance of competing, but if you're going to compete, I'm sure that Brazil has got a trials to put people in place for you know their team and if anderson wants to do that then anderson should put himself in the position to go through those trials and let's see how he does i don't think it's going to be the result that people think since the early days of mma there have of course been numerous olympians who have transitioned into our sport dan henderson itahiko yoshida right now ben askren ronda rousey But the pipeline, as you all know, John, has never flown in the other direction. Pro MMA fighter first, Olympian second. The closest that I could find, and it's not quite a fair comparison, is Joe Warren. Joe Warren was the 2006 Greco-Roman Wrestling World Champion, started MMA in 2009. In 2012, he went to the U.S. Olympic trials in Greco-Roman wrestling. He failed to qualify for the squad to go to the Olympics. That's about as close as I can find. In the last Olympic cycle, George St. Pierre was talking about trying to qualify for freestyle for Canada. That never happened. He never even went to qualifying. Of I course asked ben he Askren. didn't. He knows. I asked, I asked Ben Askren about it. Ben Askren said no chance. He said it's totally different wrestling for MMA and that. He said Absolutely. he would be eaten alive. It just seems to me that the dedication that you have to do in MMA with all the different disciplines, going to your fight gym, I'll be in my fight gym tomorrow, guys are working a lot of, on a lot of different things. 
I've never done Taekwondo, but I presume if you go in a Taekwondo gym at a high level, all they're doing is working on Taekwondo. Just like in a Judo dojo, all they're doing is working on Judo. They're not working on other things. Absolutely. I mean, look, at you're specializing. You, you've put yourself, this is my sport, this is what I'm going to compete at. And so you specialize with it. This is why when people sit there and go, oh, Floyd Mayweather in an MMA match. Well, of course he's not going to do well. Okay, he specializes in using his left and right hand. But if you put an MMA fighter in a match with him, you know, in boxing, guess who's going to win? You know, he is so good at what he does with his hands because that's what he practices. That's what he trains at. That's what is what is his sport. MMA has got so many elements that we make our fighters have to train in multiple elements multiple levels of it all these different types of intricate things they have to learn so they can hardly be the master of anything we'll get the guys like the olympians like a ben Askren. he's a master of wrestling when he was a wrestler is he the same wrestler now that he was back then no because he has to spend time doing all these other things to try to get himself at that level in mma where he can be competitive but he was a phenomenal wrestler He's not the same wrestler. If you put Ben Askren even today in, you know, put him in the you know, Olympic trials, he ain't going to make the Olympic team. He hasn't put enough time into wrestling at this point of his career. You know, Ben Askren, when he was fighting for Bellator, we had this discussion, honestly. And he, he's, he's, a, he's a guy who has a very good opinion of himself. I like Ben. That's not a knock. He has a good opinion of himself. But he said the same thing because he knows that those guys, all they're doing is wrestling. And Dude. he had his Olympics in 2008, and he knew that he wasn't going to go back once he made the commitment to essentially going to a different sport. Yeah, I mean, you could take it, you know, look at the best, uh, but the best U.S. wrestler right now, Jordan Burroughs. All right, Jordan just ended up, I think, winning his 100th international match. He is, you know, the Olympic gold medalist. He is just phenomenal. At what he does. Now, he's a lighter weight class than Ben Askren, but if you put Jordan against Ben right now, Jordan's going to tear Ben up on the mats. Okay? That's just because that's all Jordan's doing. All he's practicing is wrestling. Ben is not doing that anymore because that's not, that's not what's going to make him successful. He has changed sports. And to sit there and think that because I know martial arts or I know how to throw you know, a crescent kick or I know how to do this, I can be part of the Olympic team in Taekwondo. I think that Anderson is looking for a way to you know, get on the Olympic team. That's awesome. But you have to earn that spot on the Olympic team. And I don't believe that Anderson has the skill to earn that spot. Every week here on Let's Get It On, we bring you our poll question. You can cast your vote on our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. This week's poll question, do you think Anderson Silva will participate in Taekwondo at the 2016 Summer Olympics? Again, cast your vote now. Let's get it on podcast.com. And, of course, John, on this program, our mantra is that we separate fact from fiction. Let's do this right now. Let's put this ridiculous notion to bed that mixed martial arts is someday going to be in the Olympic Games. <laughs> it's unrealistic to the point, just like you're laughing, of being laughable. It's incredibly naive to think that. Let's get into the reasons why. Do you want to start or should? I you know go ahead you can start because it's people people look at it in a way that it's funny because they sit there and they go oh this could happen you're not even thinking about the logistical nightmare of these fighters having to go through how many fights four five fights in a 16 17 day period of MMA, where there's you're allowing all these different things, they're going to have to water it down so far that people would not like it, and so it's not the sport of MMA. So coming up next summer in Rio de Janeiro, the 2016 Summer Olympics, they are scheduled to run for 17 days, which includes the opening and closing ceremonies, although athletic okay. events happen on those days. Let's say a tournament consists of 16 fighters per weight class. That means to advance to the gold hold medal on. match, hold on. Stop, you would have stop, to win stop, stop. four fights. Hold on, stop. 16 tournaments in each way. way no, no, 16 Are you fighters. I, no, 16 I mean, fighters. Let's say okay, but 16 fighters. Think about that. Is there only going to be 16 fighters from all these countries in a weight class? No way. 
Right. There's going to be more, which means you're going to have to have more fights. But even if it were 16, that's four fights. Even if you went down to eight, you're still saying basically you have to fight world-class competition three times in a span of just over two weeks. John, let's start with medical suspensions right there. That completely ends this ridiculous idea. Well, you know, if someone's winning, obviously they have a chance of not having the medical suspension. But you can win in our sport and be damaged and be damaged significantly. And so now we have a guy that wins or a girl that wins and they can't move on. And so there's just a lot of, uh, there's just nightmares out there as far as putting together our sport. And this is when, you know, I try to tell people all the time when it comes to, you know, everyone gets back to, we need to get back to tournaments. No, we don't. No. Okay, there's reasons why dinosaurs died, right? <laughs> it's just the way it is. And, and you've got to be smart enough to say, hey, the sport has progressed. It's moved past that. That helped gain attention. It helped get people's interest. But you're killing your product with that tournament. You're killing your fighters, which is your life's blood for this sport. You can't do that to them. And so we need to take care of them in a way that we, you know, they can compete to the best of their abilities and when we're forcing them into four or five fights in a basic two-week period, it's too much to ask of the fighter to compete at a good level and to get through without being damaged in some way in one of those contests. Just look when Bjorn Rebney was still in charge of Bellator and we had the tournament. So those were essentially win three fights in three months. What we heard from the fighters who reached the final was, I can't do this again. The weight cuts were just brutal on my body. <laughs> that was the toll. We were the weight cuts. And now, you know, we're living in an era where if you're fighting 155, you're probably walking around between 175 and 185 pounds. Good luck doing that four times in two weeks. <laughs> Dude, it's just everything. Physically, it's horrible for the fighters. You know, it's what you're asking them to do is, you know, just it's just not something that is physically going to be healthy for the fighters. Physically, they're going to be able to you know, carry out in, you know, both the weight category and in the damage category of what's going to happen with them in fights. The only way to try to take some of that away is to water down the sport. So you take away elements that are part of the sport. So you're hopefully trying to nullify some of the damage. And then you're going to end up having to nullify it so much that, you know, you don't have the sport of MMA. You have pancreation. I can see where pancreation could possibly make it back. You know, there's a possibility, but this actual sport of MMA, it ain't going to happen. Well, John, I thought perhaps submission grappling and going in under FILA, which is the world governing body of wrestling, but... Fila dropped submission grappling gi and no gi in 2013. Yep. If they say it's political in the International Olympic Committee, I mean, that's so far political past the United Nations. It's brutal. It's the most political organization, I think, in the world. <laughs> to add new sports, and if you do it outside of the structure of an established governing body such as Fila, that alone puts every other argument to rest because you have to start and end with that. It's not going to happen. And you know, you look at it, Fila's not going to sit there and damage one of their sports to try to bring in another. And that's what was happening with the submission grappling is they were getting some, you know, crossover with, you know, competitors and they were getting some as far as, you know, people complaining about why are you putting effort into this? Why are you changing this? And so it's just not a smart idea. John, final point on this. All of this talk of the Olympics, did you think that anybody at the high levels really believed this? No one ever talked about this from the International Olympic Committee. We know where this was coming from. This was coming from some key people inside the UFC. Do you think they really believe this, or is this just a way to generate some attention? I think, you know, I think anything is, you know, an idea. And when you get that idea and you think, I can, we can make this work, you sometimes don't look at everything that's involved with it. I think it's always good to get, you know, media attention on your sport. And I think the, you know, whatever promotion or whatever organization out there that is bringing, you know, attention to the sport of MMA, God bless you. That's awesome. You know, as long as it's good attention. But when you look at the entire breakdown of what would take place, how it would have to take place, and then what it's going to do to the other sports, because, you know, look at I used to use it all the time when, you know, trying to get athletic commissions to legalize the sport of MMA, you know, early on, I would talk about, look at, 
what we do is what is in the Olympics. We have boxing in the Olympics. We use the same skills as a boxer. We have judo in the Olympics. We use the same skills as a judo competitor. We have taekwondo. I would use that and say we use the same type of kicks as a taekwondo competitor. We have wrestling. We use the same takedowns and same holds in some fashions that you'll see in Greco-Roman and freestyle wrestling. I was using the Olympics as that thing that showed that, you know what, everything that an MMA fighter is doing comes from Olympic sport, but I was never trying to show that, you know what, let's take all of those things and now let's bring them into one to get it in the Olympics. You're possibly taking away from your other sports, and that's something I think the IOC would look at before they would ever even consider bringing in MMA. Did you and I just separate fact from fiction or just crush dreams? I think we crushed dreams. <laughs> <I think we did. laughs> well, we're back with you next week to crush more dreams on an all new episode of Let's Get It On, first available on Friday. Download, subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store for Android. Download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And of course, you can go straight to our website, Let's Get It On Podcast.com. You can also find us on social media, Facebook.com slash Let's Get It On Podcast, and on Twitter at Podcast MMA for this show, and for us personally at John McCarthy MMA and at Sean Wheelock. To ask us a question, make a comment, or inquire about becoming a sponsor of Let's Get It On, email us at info at let's get it on podcast.com. Once again, and that is info at let's get it on podcast.com. For John McCarthy, our producer Chris Lakin, and our entire crew, I'm Sean Wheelock. Thanks for listening, everyone. This has been a presentation of Ignotainment Media Network online at ignotainment.com. Let's get it on with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock, only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Don't forget to leave a rating and review in the comments section of the iTunes Podcast Store. If you have questions, comments, or are interested in sponsoring the show, contact us at info at letsgetitonpodcast.com or check out our additional lineup of podcasts, including Ocho Man, Behind the Eight Ball, the Whiskey Philosopher, and Youth Baseball Talk at Ignotainment.com.